How should the best parts of psychology and economics interrelate in an enlightened economist's mind? Two views. That's the thermodynamics model. You, you know, you can't derive thermodynamics from, from Newtonian uh, gravity and, and, uh, and laws of mechanics, even though it's a lot of little particles interacting. And here's this wonderful truth that you can sort of develop on your own, which is thermodynamics. And some economists, and I think Milton Friedman is in this group, but I may be wrong on that, sort of like the thermodynamics model. I think Milton Friedman, Friedman, who has a Nobel Prize, is probably a little wrong on that. I think the thermodynamics analogy is overstrained. I think knowledge from these different soft sciences have to be reconciled to eliminate conflict. After all, there's nothing in thermodynamics that's inconsistent with Newtonian mechanics and gravity. And I think that some of these economic theories are not totally consistent with other knowledge and they have to be bent. And I think that these behavioral economics or economists are probably the ones that are bending them in a correct direction. Now my prediction is when the economists take a little psychology into account that the reconciliation will be quite endurable. And here my model is the precession of the equinoxes. The world would be simpler for a long-term climatologist if the angle of the axis of the Earth's rotation compared to the plane of the ecliptic were absolutely fixed. But it isn't fixed. Over every 40,000 years or so, there's this little wobble, and that has pronounced long-term effects. Well, in many cases, what psychology is going to add is just a little wobble, and it will be endurable. Uh, here I I quote another hero of mine, who of course is Einstein, where he said, the Lord is subtle but not malicious. And I, I don't think it's going to be that hard to bend economics a little to, to um, accommodate what's right in psychology. The final question is, if the thought system indicated by this list of psychological tendencies has great value not widely recognized and employed, what should the educational system do about it? I am not going to answer that one now. I, I like leaving a little mystery. Have I used up all the time so there's no time for questions? Well, I, think, I think that what we're going to do is we're going to borrow a little bit of time from the end of the day, some of the questions, and we're going to move in and allocate it to uh, Charles Munger. That's definitely the way. So when we have questions for uh, we'll have other people's questions. By the way, the dean of the Stanford Law School is here today, Paul Brest, and he is trying to create a course at the Stanford Law School that tries to work stuff similar to this into worldly wisdom for lawyers, which I regard as a profoundly good idea, and he wrote an article about it, and you'll be given a copy along with Cialdini's book. Questions? Yeah. Yes, I presume there would be one curious man. <laughs> and I have it, and I'll put it over there on the table, but don't take more than one because I didn't anticipate such a big crowd. And if we run short, I'm sure the center is up to making other copies. And... Yeah. <laughs> If I had listened to this talk, I might have thought that uh, Charles Munger was a psychology professor operating in a business school. Every once in a while on a micro issue, you told us uh, how you would have dealt with one of these issues, for example, with the uh, unfortunate lady from C's. But you didn't tell us how these tendencies affected you in what's probably the most important, or one of the most important elements of your success, which was deciding where to invest your money. And I'm wondering if... Uh, you might relate some of these principles to some of your past decisions that way. Well, of course, an investment decision in the common stock of a company frequently involves a whole lot of factors interacting. Usually, of course, there's one big, simple model. And uh, a lot of those models are, are microeconomic. And I have a little list of, it wouldn't be nearly 24, uh, of those, but I don't have time for for that one, and I I don't have too much interest in teaching other people how to get rich. Uh, my personal, and that isn't because I fear the competition, 
or anything like that. Uh, Warren has always been very open about about what he's learned, and uh, I, I share that ethos. Uh, my personal behavior model is, is Lord Keynes. I wanted to get rich so I could be independent, uh, and so I could do other things like give talks on the intersection of psychology and economics. Uh, I didn't want to turn it into a total obsession. Yeah. I was 24. Could you tell us the one rule that is most important? I would say the one thing that causes the most trouble is when you combine a bunch of these together, you get this Lollapalooza effect. And if you, again, if you read the psychology textbooks, they don't discuss how these things combine, at least not very much. Do they multiply? Do they add? What, how does it work? I think it would be just an automatic subject for, for research, but it doesn't seem to turn the psychology establishment on. I think this is a, like, this is a man for Mars approach to psychology. I just reached in and took what I thought I had to have. That is a different set of incentives from rising in an economic establishment where the reward system, again, the reinforcement, comes from being a truffle hound. That's what Jacob Viner, the great economist, called it, the truffle hound, an animal so bred and trained for one narrow purpose that he wasn't much good at anything else. And that is the reward system in a lot of academic departments. It is not necessarily for the good. It may be fine if you want new drugs or something. You want people stunted in a lot of different directions so they can grow in one narrow direction. But I don't think it's good teaching psychology to the, the masses. In fact, I think it's terrible.